I'm going to give you a short story of Rwanda to get us ready for Tuesday. In case you didn't know, Rwanda, a Central African country, had been a Belgian colony way back in 1884 and 85 when... Uh, the Europeans decided to divide up Africa. The Belgians got Rwanda. Okay. It's a tiny, tiny, in this picture it doesn't show it, but a tiny country in Africa. So the Belgians divided the people into various ethnic groups, three of them, Hutus, Tutsi, and Twa. Now the Belgians didn't divide them up. These, these ethnic groups um, already existed. But what the, what the Belgians did was they decided that the Tutsi, who were thinner, uh, leaner, taller, lighter skinned, thinner noses, looked more European and therefore had to be in, um, they were deemed more um, worthy of jobs, worthy of getting an education, uh, so they were treated better. Um, however, the Tutsis were the minority group, okay? Uh, the Twa were actually the tiniest group, but the Tutsis out of the, out of the two biggest groups, the Tutsis were the smaller group, okay? The Hutus were much larger, like 80% versus 20% of the, the Tutsis, okay? So what the Belgians did is they identi they put identity cards on, um, they issued identity cards. You, just like we do licenses, um, had to carry around your card uh, saying that you were Hutu, Tutsi, or Twa. Okay? And this carried on until even the 1960s until they gained um, their independence in the 1960s, okay? So although intermarriage was common, the perception of who was Hutu and who was Tutsi remained. Okay, so you still had those that married, Hutu and Tutsi married, you still had the intermarriage, but um, it was, there was definite, everybody knew who you were, whether you were Hutu or Tutsi. Okay, so the Hutus, oops, the Hutus gained control of the country after independence. Remember, they're the, they're the, uh, larger group, and over the years, a more extremist group of Hutus worked to seize power by reminding Hutus that Tutsis once held power over them, and forwarding a belief that Tutsis would one day try to take control again. The Hutus instilled a sense of fear. These fears were heightened when a group of Tutsis who had been refugees in Uganda, so here's Uganda, um, began to return to Rwanda. This began a series of battles, and the United Nations stepped in to try to negotiate a ceasefire and peace agreement. When the president of Rwanda's plane was shot down in 1994, the extremist Hutus called for other Hutus to murder the Tutsis within Rwanda. They had been preparing for this opportunity through the use of hate radio. And you got to remember, this is 1994. We don't have big screen TVs. Most of the communication done in your developing nations is done through radio. Okay, so they, uh, the Hutus had control over the radio systems, and so they could, they increasingly got worse and worse and more severe with their hate radio um, throughout Rwanda. And that's how most, uh, that's how everybody got their news. That's what they listened to. Um, but they had been preparing this for a long time. Uh, they also had militia groups called the Inner Hamwe, um, and they dispersed machetes, which was a very cheap uh, weapon of choice. So starting in April of 1994, within a three-month period, more than 800,000 people were murdered because of their ethnic identity. Women were systematically raped. Moderate Hutus who attempted to help their fellow Rwandans were also mur murdered. Um, the prime minister, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was a, a woman who was a moderate Hutu, and she was murdered. So they, they did not necessarily discriminate just against uh, the Tutsis, but anybody that they thought would stand in their way. Um, and they, they, again, it was, it was un, untold slaughter, um, in the amount of time, worse, more than, uh, what most people say, the worst one in modern history, um, including the Holocaust, even though the Holocaust took place over, um, four year period, you know, plus or minus, and, um, killed over six million, plus or minus, uh, a million or so, you, um, this was done in such a, a way, and and again in the 1960s, uh, sorry, in the 1990s, where everybody had access to their TVs. We were watching this. I was a sophomore in high school when this took place. Um, we were watching some of the news footage on on uh, uh, every evening when as this was going on. Um, 
So at any rate, the speaker that we have coming to us is a survivor of this cruel genocide that took place less, you know, just over 20 years. They just had the 20th, um, I wouldn't call it an anniversary, but commemoration of the uh, genocide um, last year. What are we doing? Yeah, last year. So it hasn't been that long. And right now, um, the, the, um, the country is being run by Paul Kagame, who was the rebel leader, the Tutsi rebel leader, that eventually took back control of Rwanda after the Hutus started the, um, the genocide. So um, it is in control. The country is currently in control of the Tutsi minority as far as their leadership is concerned. So there's, there's still a lot of questions up in the air as to how, how well off this country is even 20 years later after something as horrendous as um, a genocide that wiped out families and wiped out um, swaths of people um, on both sides. So anyways, just kind of wanted to give you some background as to where our guest speaker is coming from and what he had to go through. Um, and he will give you a lot more information, but I wanted you to have a, a background glimpse of what Rwanda uh, has been like over the last century.